Hey everybody, I hope you're having a great Friday. Let me adjust the camera just a bit here. Uh, I hope some of you have had a chance to watch today's video. I did another basics video. I mentioned it last week. I was thinking about doing this about uh, kind of the basic types of saw cuts there are because when I got to thinking about it, there aren't that many. There's really five, you know, so the video is like top five basic cuts, but really it's kind of the only basic cuts there are. Uh, really, as long as you can make cross cuts and rip cuts, you've, you're pretty much good to go for almost everything. Being able to resaw wood is pretty important and it helps out a lot, but and another option I didn't include in the video because it was just getting too long as it was, was uh, if you have a planer, a, a thickness planer, and you don't mind wasting some wood, instead of resawing them, you can just plane it down to the thickness that you need. But yeah, again, that's kind of wasteful. It creates a lot of wood chips or sawdust. But if you could use it in the garden, then that would be great. Just don't use walnut in the garden for some reason that poisons the plants. Um, let's see, I wanted to mention a couple other things and go over a couple of comments that came in early on the video. Uh, Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee commented on my video. How about that? <laughs> back from back from the dead. Um, Bruce wants to say that uh, you get a cleaner cut on cross cuts if you use a knife to make a score line first before making the cut. And that's a great suggestion. I don't think I've ever tried that before. I've heard that and I think I think you probably will, especially on probably on the back side of the cut where the wood kind of tends to split away. I know some people with if, if you have a sliding miter saw, yeah, sliding miter saw or a uh, radial arm saw, you know, that cuts, a, pulls across. I see some people who will take the saw and before cutting all the way through, they'll make like a quick little scoring cut on just the first little bit of the wood. From what I understand, that prevents a lot of that splitting. So that's worth giving a try for cross cuts. Uh, a number of people, he also mentioned the, uh, what are they called? Track saws. Track saws like Festool makes those long track saws where you can hook in a circular saw. And I probably should have mentioned that in the video, but it's one of those things I don't really consider that a basic tool. Maybe for some people it is, and it would, and definitely something other than Festool, something more affordable. I've never used a track saw, so I, and I don't have one, so it would be it would be hard for me to demonstrate that, but it's kind of one of those tools that someday I, I may look into getting a track saw that might help. And if you don't know, it's a saw that you hook up your, just a regular circular saw. I think this is the way I understand it. You hook up a circular saw to it and then it runs along like a metal track. So you can put a long board in there and just pull it down and, and make long cuts that way. I think that's kind of like what they have it at Home Depot where they cut your wood, I think. Uh, so anyways, those were some good suggestions from Bruce. Thank you for that. Uh, a number of people said that I neglected the scroll saw. I didn't mention the scroll saw and that was actually, I thought about including the scroll saw in that video, but again, I don't consider a scroll saw kind of basic woodworking. And it's also a scroll saw, even it is a woodworking tool, but it's not really a woodworking tool because it's so specialized in my mind that it's really for decorative projects and for especially thin wood to cut complex curves and shapes and more, I think it's more of an artistic tool than a tool used for building things. You know what I mean? At least that's the way I kind of look at a scroll saw. I'm kind of a lathe to me is kind of the same way. It's much more of a an artistic tool than a practical, although a lathe you can make table legs and, and those sort of things. So I don't know. But anyways, that's why I didn't include the scroll saw uh, just because I don't think it's really practical for m making curved cuts in most things. Uh, but I'll have to, one of these days I'll, I'll I'm going to just, 
I'm going to have to just make a video on the scroll saw one of these days. But I think I should get a new scroll saw before I do that. My, uh, my old scroll, scroll saw is really, it's real frustrating to use that thing. Especially to change the blade in it. Because you got you to gotta push down this thing and hold it this other thing down. And then use an Allen wrench and a screwdriver. And you, it's just really a pain. But uh, that's getting a little sidetracked there. Another thing I wanted to mention, and I, I, this is another thing I wanted to include in the video, but I didn't, was to show you this. Another way to resaw wood, to cut it in half if you don't have a bandsaw. I, and I mentioned in the video, I know a lot of you probably haven't seen the video yet because I just posted it an hour ago, but I mentioned in the video that resawing lumber on a table saw is kind of scary and it's kind of dangerous. It's probably one of, I think one of the more dangerous kind of cuts you can do on a table saw just because there's so much wood riding on just this small surface here so it's possible to wobble and so you really need to keep it pressed against the fence and you need to have some way of pressing down and against the wood as you run it through the saw. My suggestion was to only cut halfway through the wood and then halfway through the flip it around then go halfway through the other side and it takes also takes a lot of stress off the saw because if your saw i don't even think my saw blade will cut through that high at once even if i raise it all the way up but man anytime i raise that blade all the way up it's just it's just scary looking it's like wow that is a lot of blades spinning but when i've cut through and it's probably just my saw because maybe it's just not the most powerful saw but when you cut through that much wood at once on a table saw it could just really bog it down i know on my saw it'll just and then it just flips that little breaker switch in there almost every time so i think you need a more industrial kind of saw but anyways this was another technique and i have used this technique and it works out pretty good and i didn't mention it in the video because it involves using a hand saw and i was kind of keeping the video strictly on power tools so if you have a wide board like this and you have a table saw and you want to resaw it, I think it's safest to cut through, like I said, only part of the wood, not all the way through. So cut through this part, flip it around, cut through that part, and then take a hand saw and cut straight down. And these two slots will keep the hand saw going straight so you, you won't tip. And it's really a good method it works out really well and you only have that little bit to cut through so it's not like you're having to to resaw the entire width of the board if you have a table saw and a band saw it's also a good technique i've used this too it's also a good technique to do this to cut maybe not that deep just cut a little slot here and a little slot there then when you resaw this on a band saw the, the blade kind of tracks in those two slots and it keeps it running straight and square. So those were a couple of the techniques that I didn't mention in the video, but I thought were worth mentioning again. Uh, let's see if there was any more comments I wanted to get to. I think that was over the... Uh, oh, uh, Ivan suggested that I need to lower the blade guard on my uh the upper blade guard on my band saw to just above the surface of the work and that will help keep the the blade tracking correctly and that's also a good suggestion i'm yeah you know, i'm really lazy when it comes to my band saw and i just like leave everything set up there and i never adjust it and it's probably why it's not running so well and if there's ever going to be my next kind of big tool purchase, it's going to be the bandsaw. And it's probably going to happen soon because it's making weird wobbly noises and it's it's getting loud and it's not tracking correctly. It's just old and I'm really bad with tool maintenance. So I hate to do it. I hate to have to buy a new <laughs> tool because it's I've really been lucky. I haven't had to buy a major power tool in many years. I've had to buy little handheld tools, maybe a new jigsaw or something, but as far as a major tool, I haven't had to buy one. I'm pretty lucky. 
And uh, let's see. Hey, Stanley's here. Hey, Stan. Stan Purse lives nearby me. He uh, just asked what kind of bandsaw am I looking at, and I'm not really sure yet, but I want to, the only thing I know, I don't really know brands on them, I'm, I'll have to do some research on that, but I'm looking for a 14 inch bandsaw. I think a 14 inch bandsaw is a good size because it's affordable, a 16 inch bandsaw, the price just goes way up. Although on a 16 inch bandsaw, you can do really nice cuts with them, but I don't want to spend a couple thousand dollars on a bandsaw. But on a 14 inch bandsaw, I can resaw lumber, which is super important. And it's got enough power to do that. And it's got enough power to do, well, anything, any kind of curb cuts and the extra size helps. In general, I always recommend hobbyist woodworkers to go with a 14 inch bandsaw. You can get those little, what are they? 10 inch bandsaws, I guess, the little tabletop ones. I see no use useful purpose to those at all except for just cutting curves but then it's sort of like it's sort of like a more powerful scroll saw is really what what those are they actually even have like handheld band saws too and i'm not even sure what you what you do with those but anyways i'm gonna go with a 14 inch band saw and again i'm not i don't know when that's gonna happen you know what's gonna happen is i'm just gonna wait until this thing finally just it explodes in a big ball of fire <laughs> eventually it'll just that's it and it's just beyond repair i've had the thing for 15 years it's due for i do for a new one and so that's probably when i'll get a new one is when that one finally gives out it's kind of the way i end up buying things is i wait till the very last possible moment when i absolutely have to and you know when that bandsaw is going to go out on me is when I'm running late on a video and I'm making a project and it's like on a Thursday. <laughs> it's gonna be like Thursday afternoon and it's, it's gonna go. So that video the week that video the that week the video will probably be late. Okay. And see if I've got any more. I'm just gonna quickly look through uh, comments on on the YouTube video and then I will get to the comments and the questions on the live stream. Uh... <laughs> Somebody commented that they liked my, my intro. Well, that's good. I actually thought up my little micro jig limerick. It's a sort of a limerick, I guess. Like five minutes after I shot all that video, oh, I gotta do something for the micro jig. And then I just quickly came up with that thing and I thought it was funny. Uh, good. And... Okay. Uh... Sorry for my delay here. I am trying to look through some of those YouTube comments. Okay, let me start scrolling through some of the comments on the chat and let's see if I've learned to do this without making a whole lot of noise. The first time I was doing this, I was holding my hand behind, I think on the, on the microphone or something. Uh, first of all, I want to thank, uh, Hey, Michael Carter. Thank you for this super chat, $5 super chat. He wants to know, do if I, he says, do you think you'll go with the new or used bandsaw and what about building your own? I won't be building my own. Uh, it would just take me too much time and I, I really don't think I could get a video out of that because Matthias really has the best one out there and his, he's built like, I think about 150 bandsaws at this point. So... <laughs> If you want to, if you want to build a bandsaw, go go watch one of his videos. But no, I'm not I'm not really much for building shop tools. I just would much prefer just to buy something and then use it. And as far as buying a new or used bandsaw, um, I don't really have a preference. If I can find a used bandsaw, I will. I'll start scouring Craigslist and uh, different places like that because a lot of times I could I can get a used bandsaw which will be I can get more 
for my money on a used bandsaw and maybe something even better than a newer one. I still don't think I would go, even if I got a good deal on a 16 inch bandsaw, I don't think I would go with it just because it blade costs and maintenance and space. And so I'm just going to go with the 14 inch bandsaw, but I'll probably, I'll probably get something new. I saw a Win bandsaw, W-E-N, uh, I think it was Home Depot and it was, uh, it was like $500, which seemed fairly reasonable. The one I have now is a rigid bandsaw, which is also Home Depot. I don't know if they still, I don't know if rigid still does 14 inch bandsaws or not, but I'm going to have to just really look into, uh, look into bandsaws coming up pretty soon. And okay. So now let me get back to this. Uh, Oh, Matthew says Grizzly has a great 16 inch bandsaw for a thousand dollars. Well, that's a pretty good price on a 16 inch saw. I just don't know if I want to spend a thousand dollars on a bandsaw. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I am such a cheapskate. I just don't like to spend money on stuff. I'm like a hoarder, but I, I wish I had more money I could hoard, but I, I don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if it, I'm not sure what this is. I'm just kind of randomly scrolling through comments because I, I'm trying to catch up. But Chris said, if it goes while filming, maybe we'll see, we'll see Steve drop his first on-air F-bomb. <laughs> I don't know what that's referring to, but I think that's funny. Try to keep the show family friendly. Uh, Let's see. Okay. Hey, Peony Hardware is the best. I'll bet you that. That was Stanley too. He saw my shirt. So we both live here in Novato and uh, Peony Hardware is, it's an Ace, it's an Ace affiliate. I don't know if you know about Ace Hardware stores. They, uh, I think that there are both franchise stores and like, and, and, and company stores, I guess, something like that. Both, both types. But anyways, it's been, it's, Peenies has been in Novato for over a hundred years and they are now, and they have been for quite a while, an Ace franchise part of that deal. So it's really cool because you get the Ace branding and you get, the, you know, all those sales and everything, but Peenies gets to keep its own identity and its own feel and everything, which is really cool because there's really nothing better than having a hometown hardware store where I'm telling you, the guys that work at Peenies can answer any question I have about anything. You know, I need to fix a, a drain or some plumbing problem, and they got a plumbing guy there. They just, and the people who work there have been there forever. I mean, for at least 20 years or longer. They, the same people work there. They just love working there, and so they can answer every question I have. So it's, you know, it's amazing going there. You pay a little extra, but you definitely get that kind of service that you can't get at the big box stores. Uh, okay, I'm gonna try to try to catch up here. I'm really sorry I can't get to everybody's uh, comment and question on on the chat. I wish there was a, a better way that I could organize this. They just kind of come through fast and furious. Uh, let's see. Okay. Bert uh, says he bought a, a 14 inch craftsman bandsaw. It has an odd sized blade. I have to special order them really. Or buy the stock ones from Sears. It's a good saw though. Well, that's good to know. I, I don't know how much longer Sears is going to be around. They seem to be having problems, but that's odd because usually I think 14 inch bandsaws, most of them take the 93, I think it's a 93 and a half inch blade, 93 inch blade. And it seems to be pretty standard, but Sears Craftsman Tools is like that. They have some odd things. They, I know their table saw they were selling for a long time. I used to get this question a lot. I don't get it anymore. So maybe they don't do that, but they're the miter slots in them were weird. You couldn't put regular, you had to only buy their, miter gauge and other accessories because it had like a I don't even know if it was like a t-slot but it was some sort of weird configuration that you had to use I don't know maybe that's maybe that's why Sears is <laughs> struggling okay 
looking through some more comments. Uh, okay, from Martinez Augustinus. That's a great name. Hey, Steve, when I make a rip cut, the piece I'm cutting presses on the blade and stops it and burns it. Is that my fence not square to the blade? It's probably two things. If you're running a saw, ripping a piece of wood through your table saw, you know, like this. If the, if the fence isn't square, yeah, you can definitely get binding going into the blade and it could potentially be unsafe too. R ripping a long board, the chances are less than they would be on like a small cross cut or something just because of the weight of the board and, and all that. But yeah, you gotta make sure that the rips, rip fence is parallel with the blade. But also make sure that you've got a, a splitter or a riving knife on the end of your blade. When that wood goes through it, and I've had this happen before, if your wood goes through, especially if the wood is, uh, has some moisture in it, it can, how do I demonstrate this? Well, anyways, it can cut through this way, you're making the cut, and then what happens is the two halves will just bind together like that, and they just pinch, it's like just, the wood just wants to release itself and it somehow pulls together. That can be part of the problem. So there you got to make sure that you have a riving knife or, or a splitter to help prevent that from happening. But even then that can happen just further through the cut. Um, those would be my two biggest things. But as far as burning on the wood, there's just, for one thing, there's certain woods that just burn. I always get burns when I cut cherry. It's just almost inevitable I'm gonna get burns on cherry. And maple seems to burn pretty easily. But it's just, I don't know, I just live with it and sand off the burns wherever I can. Uh, and it helps to have sharp blades. You know, yeah, I'm kind of bad about that. I, I tend to use blades forever until I just, it's weird because I never really know when a blade is, when I'm done with a blade until I put on a brand new blade and I think, wow, this is what cutting wood should be like. It goes through so smooth, but it, they get dull so slowly that you kind of just don't even notice that they're getting dull. And so you start to just kind of compensate for it. Um, okay, we'll go through here some more. Uh, <laughs> Larry wants to know what time it is here. I don't know. Google? No, it's, it's a little afternoon. After 12 o'clock. Uh, that means tonight is movie night. Friday night is movie night. We're going to go see The Mummy. Uh, okay, here's a, here's a question from D. Capeza. Uh, Steve, I'm starting out in a new city and new to woodworking what's your recommendation to find wood that's not at those big box stores first of all don't don't avoid big big box stores just because they have a bad reputation because uh, for lumber because you can get pretty good lumber most of my lumber i get is at the big box stores home depot specifically just because it's the closest one near me i don't have a lowe's nearby so i'll get lumber at home depot but I was going to look for some examples, but I'm kind of clearing out some of my lumber. Uh, you got to be careful buying it for two reasons. First, you got to spend time going through those bins and making sure that the wood is straight, not warped, and just looks good. And secondly, that it's not really wet. I've had some wood there that is, you can just feel it, or it's really heavy, and you can just tell, wow, this still has a lot of moisture in it. And Wow, there's just nothing but trouble if you try making a project with wet lumber. So, and my Home Depot, the one in San Rafael, 
actually has a pretty good selection of hardwoods. They, they sell uh, walnut, cherry, maple, mahogany, oak, poplar, alder, I think. I think, was, I think that's what they sell over there. They don't have a huge selection, but they have enough that I can usually make projects with. The other thing that's difficult with Home Depot is that the wood isn't always, it's kind of like not from the same dye lot. I know it's not a dye lot, you know, but it's sort of like that because you can pull out two boards right next to each other and they're, they look completely different. So that takes time. So it's a matter of taking your time to find good lumber at those places. But in answer to your the next part of your question, where to find wood that's not from the big box stores, is just look for lumber yards. Most, at least larger, metropolitan areas will have lumber yards where you can mm -hmm. buy mm -hmm. all sorry about that notification uh, where you can buy all kinds of wood including hardwood i hear locally there's rafael lumber which uh, is actually right near the home depot we have three hardware lumber yards well i guess three hardware stores right nearby there's home depot there's Rafael Lumber, and then right next to, the, right across the street from Rafael Lumber is Osh, which is Orchard Supply Hardware. They don't sell lumber. They might have little pieces, but it's mostly a hardware store. So it's kind of funny how they all group together, kind of like car dealerships all tend to find each other that way. But if you can find a lumber yard, I mean, just Google lumber yards in your area and see how far you have to go. If you know, if you have a project that you know how much wood you need and what you want to get. Uh, if it's going to be a nice project, you're going to build, you know, a desk or a table or something, uh, and you want to use walnut or something special, it's worth driving to get decent lumber, definitely. But it's expensive. Uh, I don't know. Lumber just is one of those things that never, never gets any, any cheaper. That's, that's for sure. And uh, if you like hardwood, go with oak, at least here in America. And I, I can't even say all of America. Maybe it's just a West Coast thing, but oak is kind of like poor man's pine or something. I don't know if I said that right, but it's like the, the least expensive hardwood you can buy. It's actually pretty affordable. It looks pretty nice, and it's not too hard to work with. Uh, Uh, okay, Bill B says the Craftsman 14 inch and the Rikon bandsaw are the same bandsaw, just a different color. Oh, that's good to know. That the uh, a lot of companies do that. They seem to just re rebrand saws that are the same saw. I know I would see that with Delta, my sander. I would see that exact same sander. I mean, identical from different brands. Uh, Crows or Craws says, I got the Laguna 1412 and it was just over $1,000. It takes a 115 inch blade. Is that a 16 inch? No, no, that would be a 14 inch, I guess, right? So I don't know. I thought they were all 93 inch blade. Okay, let's scroll through some more. <laughs> Almud says, is this really live? It is. If I had a I have a tablet here. I could show you the time, but I, I don't think you'd be able to see the time on there. It's too small. But yes, it is live. Uh, <laughs> some of your comments are funny. I like reading all, all of your comments. Uh, okay. Olaf says, my rip fence is crappy. It came with the cheap table saw. What do you suggest? Buy a new rip fence or a new table saw? No, buy the new rip fence. In fact, I think that a good rip fence is the most important part about a table saw. And I, I, this, my theory is that the low end inexpensive table saws are inexpensive because of mainly their rip fence. And they, they usually have this weird clip on rip fence that just never seems to keep itself square so definitely i think it's worth just spending the money to buy a decent rip fence that'll work well with your saw because the saw is probably fine you know most even even smaller saws they i think they work fine for at least most of what i do i'm not running through huge chunks of wood where i need a lot of power so 
just a little, even a little tabletop, table saw seems to do fine. But yeah, get a decent rip fence. Sometimes people ask me if, if you can make a rip fence for a table saw and I, I think you could. Again, that's probably something Matthias Wandel would do. But that's, that's way beyond my wheelhouse and I would never actually recommend somebody doing that because it's just too, too much room for error and danger and it just seems scary to me because you got to keep that thing really straight and square. You make a rip fence for a router table or a, or a fence for a drill press, those are easy because they don't have to be aligned with anything. Uh, lots of comments coming in about the bandsaws. Oh, here's James. James Dunn says he picked up a really nice, almost new, rigid 14-inch on Craigslist for 180 bucks. See, that's the kind of deal I want right there. <laughs> 180 bucks for a 14-inch, fairly new bandsaw. I'm down for that. Uh, and you said you could put a riser on it for another hundred bucks. The blades are only a dollar more than the 14 inch size blades. Oh, that's great. Great to know. Thank you for that information. That's probably what I'll end up doing. I'm going to keep looking on Craigslist. Uh, Thomas wants to know if my shop is next to my home. Yeah, it's, it's part of my home. This is my garage, my house. I just go through this door, that door right there, go up about eight steps, and I'm into my office, which is, I think the office in this house is technically supposed to be a dining room. We've never used it as that. It's just always been an office. It's a small house. So we have to, like, repurpose rooms for things that they weren't intended to be used for. But it's kind of nice because it's a three-bedroom house, so the third bedroom is a craft room. It's my wife's craft room. Uh, uh, okay, Sean says, he's new to woodworking. Why do miter cuts on a table saw seem impossible? Um, I don't know. It might be your miter gauge isn't very good. Somebody sent me my, and I wish I knew who it was, I could remember, it's been a while, it sent me that Incra, let me show this to you. I can't, in all good conscience, recommend buying one of these, because I think these are probably outrageously expensive. I don't know how much they are, but I think it's overkill. It does a great job, but for... For what I do, I don't really need this much. I mean, this has a fence that slides out and everything, and it's it's like super accurate. I mean, you can you can dial this into like just micro degrees. It's kind of amazing, but it's really kind of overkill, especially for my saw. It's probably worth more than the saw. But you can get a good miter gauge. Just you probably don't have to get one like that. I'm going to guess that's probably the biggest reason why you have a, are having a hard time making good miters on the table saw. I also have to have a good way of holding the wood steady when you're using a miter gauge because you're coming at an angle and the saw blade wants to make it slide. So it, the best way to do it is to clamp it to your miter. Oh, let me show you something else. I'm still here. Follow my voice. Follow my voice. Um, <laughs> oh, here it is. So I'm back. This is the miter gauge that came with the saw. This was actually a pretty decent uh, miter gauge. It's got some weight to it. it. It runs smoothly. I recommend adding a fence. Just put a board on there, screw a board to it, just so you have a little extra space because this little bit here is usually it's not enough. And especially when you go to make the, you know, like a 45 degree, a 45 degree cut it can be really be hard because this ends up being you know, too far away from the blade so add an extension on there uh, that's that's what I've got for making miters on a table saw you know for a long time I only made miter cuts using my miter saw because it was just so easy to do but I was having problems getting them to be perfect and at least what I consider perfect enough especially on 45 degree ones. And I know I could probably fuss with it and tweak it to get that. But once I started making 
miter cuts on my table saw, I realized I can get a lot better, a lot more accurate cuts. And it just, it may be me, it may just be because of that, it, that stupid expensive ink or miter gauge that lets me do that. But I don't know anymore. It just seems like I'm using the table saw for almost everything. And I'm hardly using the miter saw. I occasionally use the band saw, mainly just for curves. And I, I think I would use the band saw more if I had a band saw that I could rely on more. Well, that's kind of what I've been, my woodworking is kind of, it shifts from year to year and I, I can kind of see myself evolving and using different tools differently. And right now it's really kind of all about the table saw. Um, and hey, Ben, thank you for the <coughs> super chat. Uh, ben says, <coughs> excuse me, my voice is getting froggy. I actually have water here too. Uh, ben wants to know if my power tools are single phase or three phase. How many plies do you get in a three quarter inch ply? I think there's over seven. Sorry, I don't know long how long you've been going. It's 5:30 here in Australia. That's early in the morning. What do you go back to bed? So, yeah, so Ben, uh, single phase is my power tools. I don't. There's nothing fancy about those. And, and it's probably some of the reason why I don't, I don't seem to have a lot of power. Uh, how many plies do I get in three quarter inch plywood? I have no idea. Let me see. Let's, uh, this is a typical, here's a typical plywood. This is, this is good plywood. This is uh, Baltic birch. So it has a lot of plies. So. We're looking at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Looks like maybe 10, and I can't, I'm not quite sure, but it looks like there's 10 layers, and then there's a thin veneer layer on the top and the bottom of that. I don't know if that's normal or if that's a, it seems like a lot to me. I know you can get real cheap plywood, like construction grade plywood that, and I might have some of that too. Let me see. See, this would be like more construction grade, and you can see that that one, I can count, I can count the plies on that without my glasses. One, two, three, four, five plies. Uh, so it's not as good. The more, the better. And it just seems to, this kind of construction grade plywood will have like knots in it. And then you can also get these big, this one doesn't have any. You can get these big divots in the sides to big holes. And so it's kind of hard. It's good for making shop projects, shop furniture, that sort of thing. But, you know, for making anything else, I would go with uh, the Baltic birch. But that's how many I have. And so, yeah, Ben says in Australia it's seven plies. So I, I don't know. I think it's just all different kinds. But thanks for the super chat, Ben. I really appreciate that. Okay. I got to wrap this up pretty soon because I've got a meeting at one o'clock. Uh, Hey, there's Tom from the Homecraft Chronicles. Plumbing? Ask me. I'll have to do that. I'll have to ask you about some plumbing. Last year, we spent $10,000 on getting a new drain installed. Oh, that's like the worst thing to spend money on, you know? It's like, because it's all buried underground. Nobody sees it. I always thought that plumbers, when they do drain projects like that, they should have, give you the option to put like, thick plexiglass over the top of it instead of just putting concrete back over it so that you know people come over you can say hey, look what i spent ten thousand dollars on and you can just show them the drain pipes right 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 through that glass you know so you got something to show for but no but it is nice to be able to flush the toilet properly now and it's kind of like tires tires are the same thing i just hate buying tires for the car because it's just not it's not the sexiest thing you can buy for a car and they're, and they're expensive, but you just, you gotta do it. Okay. I'm going to try to catch up on some of these comments. 
Uh, oh, this is a good comment from Gary, Gary Bush also. Type of blade you use, uh, type of blade can cause that also. If you use high teeth blade, it may bog down your cut. Right. I was probably referring to my table saw, but that's also true with the band saw. When you're resawing wood, you really should use as few teeth per inch as possible. I think you can get like two or three teeth per inch saw. So in other words, it's just one big tooth with a huge gullet in there so that when it cuts through the wood, the sawdust in there gets thrown out with spine teeth. It all just gets clogged up in there and it's just hard to, hard to saw lumber that way. All right. Um, Uh, Sima 99 once he says, hi, Steve, how can you assure that the fence is completely parallel with the blade on a table saw? Those fences on basic table saws seem to be able to be locked, but not parallel. That's the problem with those. And I'm telling you those blades that come with those cheap, really cheap table saws are like that. I had that same problem on my old craftsman saw, although I kept using that same fence. I always used it, but I actually had to, every time I used that fence and locked it down, I would measure with a tape measure, the front of the blade and the back of the blade, the distance to the fence to make sure that they were both the same. It was a real pain to use that. There, they, most rip fences should have some sort of an adjustment where you can tune it and, fine tune that and make sure that it's parallel. And I think there's some methods for just running boards through to test how parallel it is, but I'm not really sure what those are. I would just kind of measure, make sure that it's, make sure that it's parallel. But yeah, they, they really cut back when they, on saws because of, with those rip fences. So to some extent, the miter gauges too on those low end saws can be a problem, but they're not as much of a problem as, as the rip fence. Okay, let me get in a couple more questions here. Uh, with the car going down the street, sounded like it was about to fall apart. Uh, okay, I'm going to just scroll up here. Sorry, everybody, for not being able to get to your questions. Uh, Lots of people recommending Grizzly bandsaws. I'll have to check those out. I think uh, that I think Grizzly is just is, in general. Grizzly seems to make pretty good tools that are fairly affordable. And scrolling, 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 scrolling. I'm trying to catch up here. Okay. Uh, Silvio says he's watching me and Matt Cremona at the same time. Oh, Matt's doing a live show too. That's cool. I like Matt. I met Matt a few years ago at a woodworking convention. And he's just like he is. You see him on his videos. That's exactly the way he is in person. He just is, it's like the, he's always laughing. Um, okay, and okay, Larry wants to know, I think I might have answered a question similar to this last week, have I ever cut myself using a saw, did I learn anything from it? I, I think I mentioned before, I, I have a pretty good track record with tools because I'm super cautious with them and I haven't cut myself on any power tools. Most of my injuries have been on sanders because I get my fingers too close and I'll scrape my knuckles on them because I think it's the safest tool and, and that's annoying. I haven't had any made, but I was thinking about that last time and I forgot one time 
One of the worst cuts I got was on this. This is a flush trim saw. You've probably seen me use it for uh, cutting off dowels, dowel pins. And like an idiot, I had my hand on and I was cutting this way until it went through the dowel and went right into my finger and it just left a nice cut there and it bled like crazy because this is so, so sharp. So that was, that's probably the dumbest tool injury I've had was with a hand tool. And I, I really think it's, I should spend, when I use a hand tool, I should probably think about it more on how, even though it's a hand tool, it's still a potential for danger there. I should look at them the same way I look at my power tools because when I'm using a, a power tool, I'm just like super careful all the time and make sure, uh, make sure that I don't have anything happen because I want to keep woodworking for many years to come. Uh, okay, I'll check that one more time. And you guys, I gotta get rolling here. I wanted to mention that uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna be doing a live, uh, next week, I'm gonna be out of town. Uh, I'm gonna be attending my mom's memorial. And then the following week, uh, I'll be at VidCon. So if anybody's down in Anaheim, LA area, uh, stop by VidCon and say hi, VidCon, and say hi. This will be like my fourth year at VidCon. It's, it's a lot of fun. And so, but I hope I might be able to get a video out next week, even though I have, oh, I have a couple of days. If I can start working on a project this weekend, I might be able to have something next week, but I'm not gonna make any promises about that. And I also wanted to mention, as far as the live shows, I'm gonna keep doing these after I post my regular weekly videos because I think it's a lot of fun to kind of do a quick follow-up on some questions I start seeing come come in right away. But I'm also going to do uh, some special Q&A shows and the next one we're going to do is going to be in June 20... Hold on a second, I'm looking at my calendar right now. This just really makes for some great live video, huh? Just me staring at this. Uh, oh, here we go. Okay, so um, June 30th, I'm going to be doing a special live stream for everyone, but I'm going to be taking questions. I'm going to be taking, compiling comments from people on Patreon. So if you're on Patreon, I'm going to be asking you for tool maintenance tips. So what I want to do is get those combined and pick out the top 10 tool maintenance tips that you guys come up with over there on Patreon. And then, and this is going to, I think this will be fun is I can actually, I'll take the camera around to my shop and see how good I am at those maintenance tips. See if I've actually done any of those. Cause like I say, I'm pretty bad at tool maintenance. And so you may get a good laugh out of my horrible tool maintenance, but I'm looking for your tool maintenance tips and We'll do that special live stream on June 30th. Um, then the other one we have planned will be in July. We're going to do a special live stream on where are they now? I'll be asking uh, also Patreon patrons to uh, for your suggestions on what you would like to see, projects I've made in the past so well, we can see what's happened to them and how well they've hold, held up. And if they're even still around, we'll, we'll take a look at those together because I have about a thousand projects in my house I think it's just filled with woodworking projects so that's all I got for now I'm sorry everybody if I didn't get to your question I know there's just hundreds of questions and comments and it's really fun to read through those and I just I wish there was a way that I could answer every single one of your questions and we'll try to figure something out a little bit better in the future for right now I think patreon seems to sort of be working because I can kind of get those questions collated in a sensible way uh, that's all i got for now thanks thanks everybody i'll see you next week no i won't see you next week i'm gonna be out of town i'll see you sometime so follow me over on instagram you'll see me over there all the time bye